John Barnett here, and welcome to what you see on the slide in front of me, the Discovering Paul's Life and Letters course. Now, some of you, this is your very first time watching this. Others of you have been with us for months, because actually, uh, the prequel uh, to this course, uh, the, the first series was Discovering the Land of the Book, which is going through the Holy Land. And that was a year-long journey through the life of Christ, uh, using the Bible as our textbook, and using the, the land of the book, the Holy Land, Israel, as the classroom. And we've studied through all the chapters of the Gospels, uh, even some of the chapters of Acts, and we've, we've studied the life of Christ. And so everyone that's, that's in a member of that journey, you've been seeing this course begin. Uh, as Bonnie and I travel, I've been taking pictures and posting and, and telling you about it, but this is the first official lesson. So welcome. Uh, some of you, as I said, it's number one. For some of you, it's number one after a whole year that you've been going through. I'm going to kind of repeat everything that those of you that are with us uh, going through the life of Christ and the land of the book, that course, I'm going to repeat everything for Paul. So It'll just, uh, like Peter said, I want to stir you up by way of remembrance. But on the, first of all, on the slide in front of you, what you're looking at is a year long. So this is 52 weeks. We're going to discover Paul's 13. Remember, he wrote 13 letters. And we're going to discover the message, the, the theme of every letter and all the messages and lessons within each chapter. In fact, Paul wrote uh, 89 chapters of the New Testament. That's a third uh, of the New Testament chapters. There are 260 New Testament chapters, and Paul wrote a third of them, or more than a third of the New Testament. Uh, you will need, and this is just happens to be my current uh, journal that I have with me. And by the way, Bonnie and I are, what, four floors up, I think, right now in a I don't know how old uh, building here in London, when I look out, uh, it's, it's old, 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 probably a couple hundred years old. But we're, we're in the, this um, borrowed home where I'm staying as we're speaking here, and it's amazing. In fact, Bonnie just found out, we've been smelling smoke, that uh, earlier this year there had been a, a 100 firemen called out fire in the basement of this building. And so, kind of like everywhere we go, we smell a little smoke, and it kind of uh, keeps us on our toes thinking about everything is going to burn up anyway. But, but here we are in London. My wonderful wife, Bonnie, is right over there um, in the corner of this very tiny little room we have filming this so I could share this first lesson with you. This is my journal. Uh, in the front, I listed off all of Paul's epistles, how many chapters are in each one, and also I added that Paul is mentioned in 21 of the chapters of the 28 of Acts. And so I started my journal, and you can do this any way you want, as, as I've always shared with you in the other uh, weeks we've spent, the 52 weeks in the Holy Land. I actually write the very same thing on every page. The chapter I'm on, and the first page of my book has Acts chapter 8, and then I write down the remember the title, the theme, the summary of the chapter, and I wrote, Saul Persecutes the Church, and on through 9, 10, 11. But where I want to take you today and, and in this lesson, I'm going to just survey chapter 13, when we have Paul's first missionary journey, okay? And, and I wrote, uh, you can see my notes here, I read through the book of Acts, chapter 13. I titled it, Paul's First Missionary Journey. I wrote a summary, uh, the model God picked for global evangelism by the local church was Antioch. So that's my summary after reading the whole chapter. That shouldn't be your summary because you think differently. All you're doing is you capture what you saw in the verses of that chapter. Uh, then I wrote the lessons and I found five lessons um, that one in verse one and a couple, or I mean the second one is in verses two and three, and then I wrote from verses four through 12, Satan sends dem uh, demonic opposition, that's 13, four to 12, and then um, 
in verse 13 to 41, God captures Paul's first uh, recorded message. And what an amazing thing to hear Paul. By the way, Paul, I'm going to show you in a minute, trained in the best school of all. Uh, while we're over here, uh, Bonnie and I have been teaching through England. We were in the north, and then we came down to the south. And on the way, we stopped for our day off. Uh, we get a day off ever so often. And we went to Oxford, of all places, Oxford, England. And we were eating breakfast, and I had my Bible and my guidebook, and I couldn't believe it. And I thought, this is an amazing place that God has let us be. It's kind of the, the heartbeat of, of the English-speaking world's evangelism and missions. And all of that took place through God using the people at Oxford. But, but uh, then we've made it down here, and I'm teaching down here in London. I wrote Paul's first recorded message. Amazing to see what Paul taught. And then finally, Gentiles begged to have more. That's chapter 13, 42 to 52. How do you like that? When Paul taught the Word of God, the pagan Gentiles that came to faith in Christ begged him not to stop. Now that shows the heart of those early believers, and that shows what kind of heart God wants us to have. Uh, do you long for more? I, I mean, you just can't get enough of it. You, When you get done reading the Bible, you want to just look forward to your next time studying and learning from it. That's what was going on in the first century. So this is my journal. And uh, I will be alluding to that all the way through. Then I have my Bible, and I'll show you. I always uh, mark in my Bible and underline, and I'm going to emphasize that through this course, that, that you should be a very active Bible marker. Okay, back to the slides. Uh, first of all, at the top, I wrote, God calls the Roman Empire the fullness of the time. Now, that's Galatians 4. Galatians 4. Four and five. I'm not very good iPad writing today, but you can kind of see what I wrote there. And so Paul's first epistle is Galatians. So his earliest uh, written down word of God that God inspired him to write was this. But when the fullness of the time had come, Galatians 4.4, 4, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those that were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now that, those two verses are so full of history and culture and language and powerful application to us. And that's an example of what we're going to study. But let's, let's get into the slides. This is the Roman Empire, the brown you see. Uh, the blue is right here, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, today, as I'm recording this, I'm right here. I'm in Londinium. If you can see that on your map, that's uh, the, the Roman name for London. Uh, earlier, uh, I was teaching up here in uh, uh, Iboracum, that's York. And then I'm going to allude to right here, that line where the brown stops, that's Hadrian's Wall. You see, this is the lower part from here down is the lower part of the uh, of England, and this over here is Ireland, and up here is Scotland, and we're in Roman, uh, the Roman province uh, of what we would call England. Okay, what we're looking at in this course is discovering the life and letters of Paul, and it's now. Now this is what's so important. I've taught the epistles of Paul since I was 13 years old. So over 50 years, I've been teaching Paul's epistles. This is the very first time in 50 years I'm following what you see on your slide. Because when I started preparing for this course, I was, I was deeply intrigued by how beautifully all of Paul's epistles fit in the, the panoramic picture of the book of Acts, okay? And I'm going to show you all this, and, and I'm, uh, honey, you have to keep track. I'm going to have to keep this to an hour, so do something over there like this so I know. How many minutes am I on right now? Nine, Nine and a half minutes. Okay, I'm going to think faster and, and talk faster and try and get through this. But we're discovering the life and letters of Paul, journeying through, look at this, Acts. 
So we're gonna use the book of Acts kind of like as the, the whiteboard, and I'll be teaching through, you know, Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and we'll get to the conversion of Paul, and then 10, 11, and 12, and we're talking about his discipleship with Christ in the wilderness uh, and, and of Arabia, and then when he's discipled and nurtured in Antioch, and when he goes back to Tarsus, and then chapter 13, he's in Antioch and launched on the missionary journey. And we'll see all that. But look at this. To see the context and the message of all 13 of Paul's epistles. Have you ever wanted to understand how Paul's 13 epistles fit together. That's what we're going to do. Have you ever wondered about why God had him write them in an order? And is there some, is there some divine format God was following? Yes. Wait till you see the, the theme and how it, it goes completely with God's plan to, to unfold the mystery, as Paul calls it, of Christ in us. Okay, next. This, whoop. Back up. Discovering the life and letters of Paul Course uses a devotional method. That's why I started out with showing my journal. Writing a title for every chapter and then summarize that entire chapter in one sentence. Now those are using your own words. I always emphasize this. This is you personally discovering truth from God's word, writing it in your own words. Then Use your journal each day as you note as many lessons. I just shared mine with you from chapter 13. Truths, doctrines, as you can find. Write them in your own words. You, you read the study Bible. You read any online materials. You read, I'll have so many different resources. I'm going to be showing you some all the way through this course. In fact, we're here in London. One of the benefits of, of teaching here, where I'm teaching here in London is, I have gotten a pass to be able to go every day to the British Museum. And so whenever there's a free moment, I, I take my lunch or, or yesterday I went for after classes and, and had a cup of coffee and I walked around. You know what I did yesterday? I walked around and looked in the face of every Roman emperor connected with the early church. The, the actual authorized by the emperor statues that have been collected and brought into the British Museum from all over the Roman Empire, I just stood there and looked each one of them in the face and, and pondered what impact God allowed them to have as we see from the, the Word of God and the, the records of the early church, what impact they had on the spread of the gospel. Some of them had an incredible impact. When we were up in York or uh, in Marcium or whatever Rome called the city of modern city of York, Constantine, the general that was fighting the barbarians up in Scotland, that Constantine, whose father was one of the four leaders of the empire under Diocletian, his father died and the army proclaimed the son Constantine should take the place of dad and lead the Roman Empire, and he did. He had a prof probably the most profound impact on Christianity as he legalized Christianity and set off in what we see today, the freedom that Christianity has had century after century to go into all the world and share the gospel. Okay, in your own words, write down what you find. To make your study transformational and I would encourage some of you, you ought to just decide. You're going to mark off on your calendar. You're taking a whole year to study all 89 chapters or 87 chapters of Paul's epistles. And you're just going to study every one of them one at a time. You're going to devotionally study them. And look at this. You're going to mark up your Bible so that your Bible has, right at the beginning of each book, the, the summary, the theme of the whole book. In each chapter, you will write a title for every chapter and every verse in there that has an application, you're going to be marking. Do you know what's going to happen? You're going to become an instant Bible study leader or an instant Sunday school teacher, or you're going to become the most interesting person, you know, sitting around the table when people have nothing to talk about. You say, well, you know what I just learned about? I just learned about uh, how much God used the Roman emperors to touch the, the birth of the church. And you go, they'll go, what? And you'll start sharing what God is teaching you. 
look at back of the slide, mark up your Bible, follow the MacArthur Study Bible Notes. All the way through this course, I'm going to point out to you some of the, the deep transformational truths that Dr. MacArthur included in his study Bible. This study Bible completely has a theological grid, a historical grid, a grammatical grid, uh, and, and also the, the analogia scriptura. Everything the Bible says about every passage, somewhere else in the Bible it points at it. The MacArthur Study Bible points that out. What I tell my students, and by the way, Bonnie and I are here for these three weeks in the United Kingdom teaching primarily first-generation Christians. Just last week we were up uh, in a, an entire assembly of displaced peoples, uh, people that have been driven out of their home country, or refugees, those that, that through war or ISIS or something have been driven out of their country. And we were teaching an entire uh, ministry that's been built around, the, the I think, 19 countries these people are from. And as I taught, and I wish I could put a slide up here, but I, I don't have one right now. You should have seen them leaning forward to listen. They are first-generation Christians. And they were from all over the world. And they were looking at me, and at the end of class, I told Bonnie, they, and she was teaching a whole room full of women. I had all the men. They came up to me with their Bibles, and they were saying, um, I didn't, couldn't get that one fast enough. Where is that in the Bible? I want to mark it. And that, that desire to grow is what all of us should have. And I told them, I said, if you buy a MacArthur Study Bible, your MacArthur Study Bible is equivalent to an entire Bible college education. If you'll read every note and all the charts and all the tables, it's exactly what we taught. I taught at the Master's Seminary with Dr. MacArthur out in, in Los Angeles. What you have in that Bible is, is a condensed form of going to Bible college or seminary. So follow along, like you said, right here in your MacArthur Study Bible Notes, and then look at this. Find and mark each place on your maps. Just like I showed you uh, where York is when we're covering Constantine and, and all the, the history of the church, especially when we talk about uh, uh, Catholicism and, and the ad, what Paul was talking about with Judaism and how we see that later in church history. I will go to York and you'll mark it on your map. So I will be showing you each time there's a map we're using in this course, I will be holding it up and showing you and down in the the notes section of each video, it will contain links to those so you can know you have the exact correct one. Now here's the most important part. You've done the title, see, in your journal. You have found the lessons by reading the Bible and recording them in your journal. Now, this is what is transformational. You write a prayer in which you ask the Lord to unleash one of those truths or lessons you found into your life. I can't emphasize that enough. Let, let me just, I'll read mine. Uh, this is mine from this morning. This is my prayer. When I got all done with Acts 13, I wrote, and you can imagine me, I'm, I'm sitting in the dark, and I, I'm reading my Bible, writing this down, and when I got all done, I looked over everything I'd found and wrote this prayer out, and offered it to the Lord. And I'll share it with you. Lord, your church is so amazing, with no racism or barriers. You raise up, fill, and use everyone who bows to you. I want to bow, and I want to be used. Thank you for having patience with those who struggle, like John Mark struggled. And we'll find out he got so scared in fact, yesterday when I was going through the, the British Museum, I saw the, the Monument of Neria. And the Monument of Neria is just a one family's tomb, and it's as tall as the Acropolis. And it was they made their family tomb into a temple to Neptune, the god of the sea. And Paul and Barnabas and John Mark had to walk by that thing. And of course, you know Paul. Paul couldn't pass up an opportunity to go 
That isn't true. God is the creator of the heavens and the earth and the seas. And of course, you know, the crowd chased him down and stoned him. I stood in front of that monument to Neptune that was a family tomb, and I thought, this isn't even one of the big temple complexes. This is just a private family built this gigantic monument to Satan. You see, Satan is behind all the false gods, all the Greek pantheon, all the Roman gods, all the, the Middle Eastern gods, all the Asian gods, all the jungle and tribal group and indigenous people gods. If they are not following the true and living God, the God of this world is Satan. So John Mark, that's why I wrote here, thanks for being uh, so patient with the struggles of John Mark. John Mark, who went with Uncle Barnabas and Apostle Paul, got scared and went home. He quit. And God was patient with him. So patient with him, he gave him a second chance. You see, God is the God of new beginnings and second chances. Who wrote the second gospel? Matthew, what's the second gospel? Say it out loud. Mark, right. It's the gospel by Mark. Now, in an extension, when we're at the end of the Paul's epistles, I'll tell you a secret, I'm going to just roll right into Peter's because by the time I get there, I'm going to be teaching in Rome and, you know, all of it's connected and I'll just roll into that. But it's the gospel by Mark through the eyes of Peter. Mark, at the end of his life, sat next to Peter, the most wanted man in the Roman Empire, hunted by the emperor, and wrote down as God's spirit inspired Peter to tell the story, the greatest story, the story of Jesus Christ and salvation. And Mark wrote it down. God is a God of new beginnings and of second chances. And for some of you, and by the way, I'm reading your comments, not all of them, but, but our staff, when they see some that are specially saying, please give this to Pastor Barnett or Dr. Barnett or whatever, they forward them to me. And what God's doing in your lives, the new beginnings and the transformation. And the one of you that wrote me and said that you were on the London subway and raised your hand and reached out to the Lord. All of those are reminders of the grace of our God of salvation. But let me finish my prayer. We'll never finish this lesson. Uh, those who struggle like John, John Mark, uh, saying the rich and powerful like Sergius Paulus and stirring Gentiles to beg for more, you can sustain through persecution and fill with joy and with the Holy Spirit. I ask for you to fulfill your purpose for me in my generation. For Jesus' sake, amen. By the way, the 13th chapter has one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible that Paul fulfilled, I mean, that David fulfilled God's purpose in his generation. That's what Paul said in his message at Pisidian Antioch when he's walking through. That's what God wants to do in my life, and that's what God wants to do in your life. He has a purpose he designed us for, a plan for our life. He put us in our family. He made the unchangeable features in our life. When I look at someone that has a full head of hair, I know that God designed me not to have one, and it's okay. And when I look at someone that, that had other benefits I didn't have or privileges, it doesn't matter because God planned where I would land in life, my family, my parents, my geographic location, my physical body. So as I surrender to him every day by getting into his word and applying it to my life, I fulfill his purpose. Okay, back down the slides. You just saw my prayer. Now here, real quickly, is the overview using the book of Acts. And don't worry. What you're seeing right here is going to be coming out on our website. And our, our website, in fact, you can follow along. Uh, there's an overlay over there, honey, you can hit for uh, the Facebook. Uh, I mean, for the, yeah, the Facebook that says Land of the Book right there. Uh, if you go to our Facebook page, this chart will show up as a picture that I posted. I'm going to upload it to that page so that you can have this. I have so many of you that say, I don't know how to get that. I want it. I want to follow. I want to use it. Well, what I do is I just take a screenshot. I have my, my iPad right here, 
and I just screenshot. So if you really want the clearest slides, screenshot them. But if you want to download something, go to that Facebook page. Okay, so here we go. Uh, just for you to see this chart, the chapter in Acts, the Roman emperor, the Roman governor, the approximate date, the key events, what's going on, and are any Bible books written in that during or in the context or the time period of that chapter. So in Acts 1, Tiberius is the Roman emperor, the prefect is Pilate, it's about 30 AD, it covers the ascension of Christ after 40 days, and look what it, the emphasis is, the ministry of Peter. And that's what we see all the way across. And notice, Tiberius is all the way across, uh, Pilate is all the way across, AD 30, and we don't know the dates of all that. And it's Pentecost, lame man healed, Peter and John arrested, Ananias and Sapphira, the seven helpers, uh, Stephen's sermon and martyrdom, and here's Saul first showing up, persecuting the church, okay? Now, chapter 9, Paul's conversion. And then he's taken off to be trained by Christ in Arabia. Peter uh, is still the focus. Uh, Paul is off for seven years in Tarsus. That's chapter 10. Oh, but look at this. Change in emperors. Caligula, um, not often referred to in very positive terms. Uh, a new prefect. Uh, then things change and Herod Agrippa uh, comes and then there's a procurator. Look, we go from prefect to king to procurator. Uh, and then another procurator here. Uh, in Acts chapter 11, we have a new Roman emperor. Look, we have each chapter has a different one. 9 is Tiberius, 10 is Caligula, 11 is Claudius. Paul is in Antioch being discipled. Persecution breaks out in Jerusalem. Peter gets imprisoned, and he basically uh, goes off the scene as being the, the premier star of the book. The first 12 chapters, Peter is just the dominant voice and face. From chapter 13 to the end, Paul. So it's the emphasis on the Jews and Jerusalem and all that. That's Peter. And then the emphasis is on the world, and that's Paul going to the ends of the earth. So that's kind of an outline, the two-part outline. Actually, the divine outline of Acts is you should be my... Um, missionaries, my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Jerusalem, uh, and then Judea, and Samaria is in chapter 8, and then the uttermost parts of the earth are from chapter 13 on with the Apostle Paul. Okay, look at chapter 13. That's the one I just did my devotions on. Barnabas and Paul are sent. Paul becomes central in Acts. The first missionary journey begins, and look what's going on at the same time. That's why I love studying this with you. This will transform how you look at the New Testament. The book of James is written right in the same time period as Acts 13. James, that's our Lord's brother. Our Lord Jesus Christ, earthly brother, was James. And he didn't believe in Christ during Christ's whole ministry, but at the end, at the crucifixion and after, he believed. And he was visited by Christ, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul records that, and he becomes the pastor of the first church. You know, you go through town, I love it. You go through towns in America and you see the first this, first church this, first church this. The real first church was in Jerusalem, and that's what James pastored. Okay, so Paul sets off, see, chapter 13, on his first missionary journey. Here are the dates. Here's Jerusalem down here in the lower right corner, and Paul doesn't set off from there because, remember, he is brought to Antioch from Tarsus by Barnabas. That's part of that prep. And he's launched from Antioch because, remember, I told you in chapter 13, Antioch becomes the model of the sending churches, the missionary churches, how church should be. Uh, when it lists off the saints that are, that are in Antioch, they're from every country on earth. It's kind of like London. Bonnie and I are amazed. Everywhere we go, it looks like the United Nations. It's just the, the British Empire has made London a magnet for people from a hundred and some countries around the world. 
That's what the church in Antioch was like. And they sent out Paul. Look, he sailed to Salamis, Paphos, goes up to Perga, uh, Antioch, and gets stoned over here in Derby and Lystra and comes back through there. And then, whoop, sails over here uh, and then goes down to Jerusalem. So there's his first missionary journey. Fascinating. You'll find a lot as you find devotional tips. Now look at this. This is Claudius. And Tiberius Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, that's his full name, was the fourth Roman emperor. He ruled from 41 to 54. In other words, when Paul set off, watch this, on his missionary journey, let me see if I can get this to work. There it goes. This is Julius Caesar over there. This, see the name tag right there, is Emperor Claudius. Now look at him. That's what I told you. I said I walked over on my spare time and went there. That's Claudius. I'm looking him right in the face and thinking, Claudius, what were you doing that's impacting Christ's church? Well, let me show you. He conquered Britain. That's what he did. That's what Claudius did. Uh, now, he sent all the legions down here, and they started in the south at Londinium and started going like this. Now, he didn't get the whole island, but he sure tried. While Paul was exporting the gospel on his missionary journeys, God raised up an emperor that would most impact the world of missions with the gospel. How's that? Well, you, did you hear what I said? Claudius is the one that told him to conquer Britain. Now, Julius Caesar had come here and made a beachhead, the, the prototype emperor, the, you know, Julius Caesar, the uncle of, of Augustus Caesar, the first real emperor. But what did Claudius do? He said, we're going to take this whole island. And they took it up to here, to the top right there. And that's what, look, look on the left there. I'm going to show you. Uh, whoop. No, go down. Now, boom. Look at this. I'm walking. See that? I'm walking down Hadrian's Wall. And as I'm walking, and now that's looking back, this side and this side marked the, the pagans or the barbarians and the Romans. Okay? Let me show you another view of that. You are looking east along the northern face of Hadrian's Wall. You are currently outside the Roman Empire. See, here was where the barbarians were. This was the Roman Empire. This is Hadrian's Wall. Now, we took a little field trip up there. Uh, I was speaking at uh, Keswick, uh, and then we did the Northern England uh, Refugee Displaced Conference, and now and then we went to Oxford, and now we're down here. But stopping at that wall made me think about something. Did you know that England exported more missionaries to more countries across the world than any other nation ever did in history? England was the epicenter of the English-speaking world's scholarship, translation of the Bible, and global missions. And you know why? Because of the voracious conquest of the British Empire. The, the British Empire was the largest empire in the history of the world. No one has rivaled them. Uh, they either uh, invaded, attacked, colonized, or occupied more of the world than anybody's ever done. 13.4 million square miles. That's one half of all the livable parts on this planet. England somehow invaded, ruled, colonized, whatever. Do you know what the greatest thing they exported was? English. It's still the global language. And what came with the English language? The English Bible. That's why I'm so thankful for Claudius. Now, Hadrian later, a later emperor, said, that's it, I'm putting the line up, I'm not fighting the pagans or the barbarians my whole uh, career as emperor. And so he built a wall and said, you can have above it and, and I'll take the rest. But that's just part of what we'll study. Okay, chapter 14, Claudius 
see all the way across the top, uh, the Roman governors change. Look at the dates. Now look what's happening. Now we're seeing something else. This is Paul's first missionary journey. The Jerusalem Council takes place, after which he writes the book of Galatians and he starts his second missionary journey. Remember, James has already been written back here. Paul's on his second missionary journey all the way through here. Look what happens in the middle of his second missionary journey. He writes two letters. See, so we're going to study. Uh, after we study Acts, then we're going to come down and do Galatians. We're going to do these in chronological order. Then 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. And by the way, last year, Bonnie and I were, were able to teach in Thessalonica. We taught in Thessalonica for two weeks. And every time, usually uh, my schedule is I teach three, two, three, two. So three classes, and then the next day, two classes. Three, two, three, two, like that, to teach these courses. As soon as we have free time, out we go to walk around Thessalonica. When we go through those two epistles, we're going to look at the places where Paul walked, you can see the place where he walked into town. You can see the bathhouse where, where Paul covered with the stripes from his beating in Philippi. On and on and on we go. Okay, uh, in 51, somewhere in there, the Gospel by Mark from the 50s on uh, is being written as, as Peter and Mark are together. Most scholars believe it's later on in the 60s. Uh, then we get to the third missionary journey when we're in Acts 18. See, Acts 17, this is Paul's Athens ministry, 16, Philippi, all of these things. It just, there's so many details. That's why you need to go to Facebook and download this and, um, and use it as a tool. Later on, when I get done with it, it will actually be a document at discoverthebook.org, our website, that you'll be able to download a PDF, the whole thing, okay? But remember, I'm teaching it right now, and I just I keep adding and adding, and I learned don't post it right away because people say, my copy doesn't have that. And so you're going to have just my working copy that I'm posting on Facebook, and then you can get the complete one after uh, I get deeper into this course. Uh, in Acts 18 is the time period for writing 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and the book of Romans. The book of Romans. Now look what happens here. See the change? New emperor. Going from the relative calmness of Claudius. Think of calm Claudius. And then think of Nero. Look, I made it red. He, he was quite an emperor. Uh, the Roman governors, we bump into them. You know, see Felix, Felix, Felix. Uh, that's the one that's dealing with Paul. The dates covering from 53 to 56. Key events in chapter 19, Ephesus, the mob. Paul's Macedonian ministry in Miletus. He sails to Caesarea. He's arrested in the mob. That's where we meet Felix. Um, Paul speaks, claims citizenship, the Sanhedrin. Uh, he's moved by Felix uh, from Jerusalem and kept in the Caesarea Praetorium. So the third missionary journey ends here. Paul's first uh, Roman government imprisonment, and that's why we're not sure um, when the prison epistles are, but we do know that they're written under the time of Nero. By the way, that's Nero. For many years, in many museums, that statue was labeled Claudius until archaeologists spent some extra time and looked at it. This was a, a large statue of Nero that was broken up uh, they had this policy in Rome that you destroyed the memory of, a, of an emperor that was bad, and they didn't like Nero. And finally, when they got all the pieces put together, that's actually Nero. Look at the sadness. The, uh, it just looks like Nero, and um, that's amazing to see. And that's what I did yesterday. I spent time looking at each of those emperors. And what Nero did was he ignited the gospel. Um, Paul, in chapter 24, gives his testimony and appeals to Nero in chapter 25. And so Paul's prison epistles probably are started. What are the prison epistles? They are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. 
those four were written, probably part one, Paul probably wrote either Ephesians, Philippians, or Philippians and Colossians from Caesarea. At least he wrote Philippians from Caesarea. He was there two years. I can't imagine Paul's pen being idle uh, and the inspiration of the Spirit, not wanting to encourage those people going through persecution. But look what's happening while Paul's in prison. Luke, being a learned doctor, is, is with Paul and, and Felix and Festus. Now see, we have a new Roman governor here. And Festus says, okay, uh, you know, here in chapter 26, Festus brings in Agrippa, and then Festus says, you need to go to Rome. And so what happened is that the lawyers, the Roman lawyers come to Paul and say, hey, we've got to, we have to represent you before Nero, and we've got to have the case written down. And God inspired Luke to write a two-part biography of Jesus Christ and his church the Gospel of, by Luke and the Book of Acts by Luke. And those two actually are, are one beautiful tapestry written by the same author from the beginning. That's why he says, I, what I began, O Theophilus, you know, I'm writing to you, O lover of wisdom. He's talking about what he already began in the Gospel by Luke. He's finishing in Luke, or in the Book of Acts. And that becomes the attending documents when Paul goes to the Basilica of Julia, that's the Roman law court, where Paul came in as a prisoner and stood in the docket and the emperor heard the case, a summary, and rendered a verdict. And Paul was released from his imprisonment to launch out into further ministry. So all that we're going to see, but Luke writes Luke and Acts during that time period. Now the last part of Acts, chapter 28, Festus is still the governor. Paul shipwrecks and he's on Malta, spends two full years, it says, in verse 30. And this is where the book of Acts ends, right here. And part two of the prison epistles takes place because Paul is in Rome from 59 to 62, two full years, so more than two years. And then from 62 to 65, he's traveling. I call it Acts 28 plus. There are only 28 chapters in Acts, but after chapter 28, I used to call it Acts 29, and, and students would say, my Bible doesn't have 29 chapters. I said, I know, so I don't want to confuse you. Paul travels. James, Christ's brother, earthly brother, is killed in Jerusalem, AD 62. Paul writes to Timothy and Titus, his dear lieutenants, uh, his son in the faith, uh, Timothy. Then Paul's captured. Now, he wanted to go to Spain. Church traditions say he might have gotten as far as Gaul or even Britain. We don't know. Uh, by the way, Bonnie and I, wonderfully, um, a couple years ago when we were speaking at another Displaced People conference, the pastor of the church there took us to a Roman camp uh, that they're excavating along the Hadrian's Wall. And do you know, while we were there, there was a big sign at the excavation that they had found a Christian church in the Roman commander of the camp's house on the base. And what was interesting is they found similar in other places that beneath the house there had been a pagan uh, false god worship place that had been closed off and sealed up and kind of, you know, tried to be hidden, and a church was built on top of it. It's almost like the commander was a pagan who heard the gospel from someone, another soldier or an evangelist, and came to Christ and erased that, you know, and sealed off that old part of his life. And when we went through that camp, we were reminded that, that Paul's influence extended across the empire. Do you know why? He was always chained to soldiers. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul saying, hi, so you're my new soldiers today. Thank you for guarding me for the emperor. Could I tell you why I have joy while I'm chained up? Can you just imagine Paul sharing the gospel? Paul? He'd say, yeah, I got stoned to death once. You, ever, you know how some of those crowds in you know, Roman province of Asia stoned people, those Jews? You've heard of the Jewish people, they stoned people. I got stoned by a crowd, yeah, 
Lystra, Derby, and Iconium, they all mobbed me. Do you know what I saw? I was caught up, and Paul shared the gospel everywhere he went. The centurion that was in charge of him during the shipwreck was amazed and gave him liberty because he was so moved by the ministry, the miracles, the, the words of Paul. Can you imagine year after year after year of imprisonment how many Roman soldiers Paul shared the gospel with? That's why the gospel went to the furthest limits of the Roman Empire through common people, business people, but very clearly recorded through the military, through the Roman legions. We're going to study that. Okay, uh, so Paul... You know, Acts 28 plus 66, 67, he's martyred, just four is martyred, and he writes 2 Timothy. Um, just a final note, what minute are we on? Wonderful. 35? Oh, good. Uh, God's plans for the future are around four empires in Israel. Now, this is why I want you to understand how important it is for us to understand the context of the Bible and of the life and letters of Paul. In Daniel 2, God gives us an overview of human history from a human perspective. God built the map for the end of the world around the people and places of the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the two eras of the Roman Empire. Now some of you, if that doesn't make any sense to you, we're going to be going through early on in this course the epistles to the Thessalonians, and there's a whole theological framework. In your study Bible, the MacArthur Study Bible, you can read that, a whole framework. But let me just give you the kind of uh, capsule version. Right, right here it is. Daniel 2, Daniel is shown an image that has a golden head, silver shoulders and chest, brass torso, iron thighs, and iron and clay feet. God tells Daniel what he's looking at. And he says, because he repeats the vision... This is from the human perspective, kind of the empires are beautiful, made of gold and silver and bronze and all their buildings and everything. But this is how God looks at it. A winged ravenous lion, a bear on its side, a leopard, a terrible beast, and a really horrible monster. That's how God looks at human history. He sees the increasing evil that, that human civilization has wrought on this earth. But here, this is the most important column. Look over here. The first empire in God's map of human history. From God's perspective, Babylon was the first global empire. Now, there was the Ming Dynasty and the Indus Valley, and there are all the civilizations all over the world. Why does God talk about Babylon? Because the Bible, the context of the Bible, it's written, Israel is always at the center of the narrative of the Scripture. Israel and the church are to go to the world, but Israel is the, the center, the hinge, on which all of the scriptures are written. And so Babylon deeply impacted Israel. Persia deeply impacted Israel. Greece, Rome. And then, in the fullness of the time, in the Roman Empire, the clock started ticking because the world ends with the revived Roman Empire, Rome too. So I won't go into that. You can study. There's a whole course on our website and on YouTube, the Revelation Course 20 Lessons, and we go through all of that there. Uh, but that head of gold talks about the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the start of the... So the Babylonian Empire started here, Medo-Persian started in 536, Greek in 330, the Roman Empire uh, at Actium in 27 BC when Augustus, Octavius Augustus came to power, and then of course the end times. Now, for conclusion of this overview, God sent Jesus and launched his church under the Roman Empire. Now, think about this. To interpret the Bible correctly, 
the context of the Bible is built around the people and places of the Babylonian, Persian, and Greek, and Roman empires. It is the Roman Empire God called the fullness of the time in Galatians 4. God says, if you want to understand my plan for the world, my plan for the future, my plan for Israel, my plan for the church, my plan for your life, it's the context of the New Testament is the Roman Empire. That's why I keep running over after every day's classes and, and I, I grab my phone. I ran out of battery yesterday. I found, and I'm going to show these uh, in the days ahead, I found an entire display at the museum on the Roman world's view of marriage, the Roman world's uh, music, the Roman world's daily life. How about this? The household gods that were in every Roman home in the empire. You know, that's why Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God in Romans 12, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Do you know what people did in their homes every day? They made a little sacrifice to their household god in the Roman Empire. They all had them. They weren't the same god, but they all were represented by the, the god of light that, that you could pick whichever one you wanted that was going to be the light of your home. And you every day made a little offering to that God and say, light my home, help me at work, help me, whatever I do as a soldier, as a businessman, or as a slave, help me. You know what the Lord said? I know the context you live in. I know the world you live in. I want you to present yourself to me every day. So I had more fun. I was in there. Um, you know, people were, I was talking. I was saying, Oh, wow, and I was reading the signs and I was videoing them. Do you know why? It just brings to life the backdrop for all these verses we're studying in all those epistles of Paul. Okay, here is the cast of characters God used. Julius Caesar is the one that thought up the empire. His nephew Augustus, under whose reign, during whose reign, Jesus Christ came and and. God said it was the fullness of time, right there. That was the fullness of time when he sent forth his son to be born. And then Tiberius, his adopted son, uh, Caligula, Claudius, the one that started uh, the, the conquest of all of Britain, Nero, the one that ignited the persecutions. And then look at this. We had a civil war and three quick emperors. Look at that. In a year. We had three emperors, actually a year and a half. And then they recalled the general that was dealing with the Jewish problem, they called it, in Judea, Vespasian, very good general, very disciplined, very victorious. So he left his son, his oldest son, Titus, to finish off the Jews, and he did. He killed about a million of them destroyed Jerusalem, the temple, then destroyed Galilee, then went down and destroyed the Jews in Masada, and was a very short time um, emperor. Actually, that date, it should be 69, or 79 to 81 AD. Then his younger brother and his younger son, Vespasian, died. Titus takes over. Titus dies. His younger brother takes over. And Domitian here is the one that exiles John, the Apostle John, the last living Apostle. And on the island of Patmos, John writes about the visit Jesus Christ made to him on that island and the, the report Jesus made of his visit to the seven churches in Roman province of Asia. Wow. And then uh, Nerva, Trajan, oh, wow, what a general he was. Then the builder and traveler, Hadrian, and on through. Uh, each of those impacted the church. This is what we're going to study. Here are Paul's 13 letters. Look at, here's the date they were written, who they were sent to, where they were sent from, in chronological order. So we're going to study Galatians, then the Thessalonian epistles, the Corinthian epistles. Wow, Romans. I mean, that's the best of all. The summary of doctrine, then the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. After the, his release, 1st, 2nd Timothy, then his second imprisonment, I mean, 1st Timothy and Titus, and then during his second imprisonment, 
2 Timothy. And look, they were sent from Corinth. Look how many letters Paul wrote while he was in Corinth. Isn't that amazing? Five. And then one in Ephesus, one in Macedonia. These four, either from Caesarea Maritima or Rome, those are the prison epistles. Uh, either Thessalonica or Philippi, he wrote 1 Timothy, and then from the Mamertine prison. So that's what, those are the, the books we're going to study in order. This is the Roman Empire. Again, see, there's Hadrian's Wall. So the Roman Empire went from Scotland up there to the uh, Sahara Desert, you know, down here, to the, you know, Arabian Desert here, right to the edge of the Caspian Sea, and... Uh, uh, all the way across the Alps and even up here, this little bump into Scythia, which is in the news right now, the Ukraine, okay? Amazing how big the empire was. Northern Africa, the heart of the uh, Middle East, and all the way uh, there to the island of Britain. Paul traveled on these Roman roads. That's part of the fullness of time. We'll study that. This is the lifetime of Paul. He was born about 4 B.C., martyred about 67 A.D. These are the events of the book of Acts that we'll study. Uh, Paul was saved in Acts 9. We could summarize his life this way. He was saved, Acts 9, trained by Jesus in Arabia. Galatians 1 tells us that. Went home for seven years. Acts 9 tells us that. He was found. Remember, God has your phone number. Some people are always worried. They've got to promote themselves. God knows where you are. He knows your address. He knows your phone number. Don't think you have to promote yourself. What you do is get into the habit every day of promoting God. Get in his word. Get obedient to his word. Share him, his truth with, first apply it in your own life, and then share it with others. And God, there's no limit to what he wants to do with you. Okay? So that's what Paul was doing. He, he went to school with Jesus and went home. And Barnabas found him. Barnabas said, where is that young fellow that was so sharp? And went to Tarsus, brought him to Antioch, that's Acts 11, disciples him and launches him on the first missionary journey. So look at this. What we're going to learn is Paul trained for 14 years in order to serve for 10. Boy, when we were in Oxford, that's how it used to be. When, when, when Bonnie and I had our coffee break and, and studied and walked around and looked at the schools where the Wesley brothers and John Wycliffe and where George Whitfield, where all of them, where Tyndale, each of them studied for long periods of time and often served for very short periods of time, uh, very difficult service. Paul trained 14 years in order to serve for 10 years to go to prison for 10 years. A hard, alone, suffering decade. Paul's last decade looked like this. After his second missionary journey, where he writes these letters, his third missionary journey, he writes those letters. He starts this imprisonment. This is the, the uh, long decade of suffering. Uh, his Roman imprisonment, and then his final imprisonment. And these are the letters that came from it. Wow. We'll study all that. Basically, the whole life of Paul that's written in the scriptures is right here. Uh, he was born here, comes down here for training, uh, gets saved up. Well, Damascus isn't on there, but it's uh, over there somewhere. Gets saved uh, down here in the desert, goes home, goes to Antioch, and starts all these missionary journeys with his final sailing to Rome. So there, I just gave you the entire life of Christ. My Bible, get a good one that you can mark in, underline and, and, uh, and find truths in, journal, and that prayer. And my final two challenges I end every lesson with. Number one, maybe from the challenge I gave you from Chapter 13, maybe you just want to read Acts 13 to kind of get ready for this course. Read about Paul's testimony, about the power of the gospel, and about the kind of people God uses and the second chance he gives people, like we saw with John Mark. Find someone that you can go to and say, hey, 
I'm starting a new Bible study. I'm going to study all the epistles of Paul, and I'm going to apply them to my life. Can I share with you what I'm learning? You know, that's the best way to start a Bible study. Go to someone and say, God is teaching me so many things. He's changing my life. He's revolutionizing me. He's making me realize I have a new beginning every day in Jesus Christ. And then I'd like to share what he's teaching me with, with you. And now you have a Bible study. And then you know what will happen? They'll say, well, I want to do it too. And you can have them in your Bible study. Second thing, pray for us. Right now we're in the United Kingdom. We're here three weeks doing the Displaced and Refugee Conference and teaching first-generation Christians. We're going on from here. I'm going to be teaching actually literally uh, the, the Paul's epistles. And that's why I'm going to, this course is going to be one of these lessons every week. Um, that, that I'm going to update you on. And then when I get done teaching all these classroom courses, I'm going to upload them to you. So you're going to actually, on a weekly basis, be getting all these overviews, introductions, how to mark your map, uh, how to find the theme and the, the overview and the key subjects of all these epistles coming out once a week right here. And we're just going to include them in the Discover the Land of the Book because what I've decided, and I haven't even told Bonnie, I'll just tell her now, that the first lesson was discovering the Gospels and the life of Christ. The second one is going through the Book of Acts and the Epistles. Because I'm teaching in Italy at the end, you know, near Thanksgiving, I'm going to do the Epistles of Peter and General Epistles. And then I'm going to include something I've wanted to do my whole life. And I've gotten the opportunity, I've been invited for four days to teach on the island of Patmos. And I'm going to teach through the book of Revelation. So all these things are just going to get posted as a part of this whole discover, the land of the book, the life and letters of Paul, and then uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, it's been a blessing to share this time with you. Let's close with a word of prayer, and then we'll go. Father in heaven, I thank you that right here in London as we're teaching that I could pause and my sweet Bonnie can capture this lesson. I pray that you would stir the hearts of those who listen, that they would want with all their heart to follow you. Uh, like the Roman citizens had their household gods, I pray that we would each present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. That just like the Romans began their day offering to their God, we would begin each day offering ourselves to you, our God, and be your sacrifice, your living sacrifice sacrificial servants. I pray we'd get in your word and would love your word and study your word and apply your word to our lives. And then I pray we'd start sharing the hope we have in Christ everywhere we go. With our co-workers, our fellow students, with our family, with those we meet along the way, even yesterday, uh, the man in the museum that listened to me excitedly taking pictures and describing Christianity and came up to me and said, I want to know more about how you know all that. And I was able to point him to you in your word. Oh Lord, I pray we would be your servants. And I pray you'd use this course in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. See you next week.